Good afternoon. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs and a professor of political science here at Brown. It's my pleasure today, truly, to uh, first welcome my friend and colleague, Mark Blythe, who, who many of you, all of you know. Mark is the William R. Rhodes Professor of International Economics here at Brown, and he's, uh, of course, Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs at the Watson Institute. Uh, Mark and I, uh, over the course of the next hour, along with you, are going to talk about the economic impact, at least so far, of the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we begin the conversation, I want to just make a couple of general points. The first one is um, that I'm so happy to see you all participating in this. I know we have people uh, watching directly through Zoom and participating through Zoom. We have people watching through Facebook Live. It's so important, I think, for all of us to remain connected. It's so important for all of us to um, care for how everybody else is doing and to keep two-way communication going on. And with respect to the public policy issues that we're discussing, it's very important to maintain two-way communication, multi-directional communication in order to not just keep ourselves informed, but to bring as many bright minds to the problems and challenges we face as possible. And on that note, I want to talk a little bit before we begin about the mechanics of this session. Uh, Mark and I will have a conversation with each other for the first 20 minutes or so, but then we want to open it up to all of you in the audience. Let me describe the, the three ways, really, that you can participate. The first way or the first two ways really pertain to those of you who are uh, participating with us via Zoom. You can ask questions or offer your comments by raising your hand, so to speak, using the hand raise function in, uh, in Zoom. And we'll be monitoring that so I'll be able to see who's raising a hand and, and I'll be able to call on you. Second, if uh, and when I call on you, I'll enable your audio so you can speak. Second, for those of you on Zoom, if you'd like to write a question to us rather than speak to us, you can use the Q&A function and uh, just type in your question and we'll be monitoring that and, and we'll then um, read those uh, aloud. And then third, for those of you who are participating through Facebook Live, feel free to ask questions on that platform. We'll be monitoring it and um, I'll get uh, a sense of what kinds of questions are being asked and then I'll ask Mark those questions. So with that introduction, uh, Mark, I want to get into the um, really the heart of what we're going to talk about, the crisis we're facing. So, you know, Macy's just yesterday announced it's going to lay off something like 80,000 of its 120 plus thousand employees. The Gap is uh, laying off something like 80,000 employees. The whole retail sector now seems frozen, at least in the United States and much of the world. Transport, tourism industry, restaurants, so much is, is just frozen right now. So tell me, a little bit how you see either similarities or differences between the current economic situation we're facing and what happened in 2007, 2008 with the financial panic. Okay, great question. So let's start with a very macro look at this. What happened in 2007, 2008 was a banking crisis. In very short terms, what does that mean? It meant that the banks had lent too much relative to what the income streams that were coming in. And when those income streams kind of dried up, the banks became fragile and they fell. At that point, government stepped in because we discovered this idea of systemic risk. That is to say that the banks were too big to fail and all interconnected. If the whole financial sector went down, it would be devastating for the real economy. Therefore, we had to bail the banks. That ballooned out debt, which necessitated in some places more than others a period of austerity, belt tightening, which increased unemployment and led to a recession. And it took basically about eight years more or less to right the ship. Southern Europe has still not been righted. That was a serious crisis. This is similar, but also very different. It's very different in the following sense. Imagine that the whole economy is a bit like a bank. That is to say there are assets out there in the world that generate income for the economy. And then there are people who work in the economy whose income streams, in a sense, valorize those assets, right? And the whole thing works together. What's happened is we're about to make 30% of those income streams disappear. That's the unemployment shock. And then two thirds of the economy that's left is going to be working from home or otherwise sequestered. 
This is an enormous challenge, the like of which we haven't seen before. And it has prompted right across the world, quite positively, an enormous set of fiscal responses to try and compensate for that shock. If you had said to me just 10 days ago or even two weeks, three weeks ago, that a Republican Senate would pass a $2 trillion stimulus and liquidity passage in addition to $1.5 trillion going out of the Fed, I would have thought, no, long odds against that. But that's actually where we are, which gives you a sense of how serious this crisis actually is in economic terms. That makes a lot of sense. You know, your, your 2013 book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, is, I mean, it's been hugely informative to me. I think it's the best book written about that crisis. But if I understood your argument then correctly, it's that the 0708 crisis was fairly typical of manias, panics, and crashes, that people bid up the value of a bunch of assets they then base their economic behavior on this hugely inflated value of assets. And um, once confidence in the value of those assets just eroded very quickly, the whole system collapsed. And there's a kind of a stigma that certain cultures and countries attach to that kind of behavior, you know, that whether it was homeowners who borrowed too much money or the banks who pushed too much money on them, the, the attitude was people made mistakes, they've got to pay the price, hence austerity. But, but this crisis seems like something different. Nobody did anything wrong. It's just a, an act of, I don't know, you know, faith, an act of God, whatever we say. But it's a, this deus ex machina came in and froze up the economy. So wouldn't that, doesn't that mean the present is different? I mean, is that why we're not hearing about austerity today? That's part of it, absolutely. Another way to think about it is in terms of the way that countries have responded to the virus shock. And that tells us a lot about how they're going to respond to this economically over the longer term. So let's be very brief. You're a China expert, so correct me how wrong I am in what I'm about to say. But the way that China responded to this was essentially command and control. When you have millions of people who are Communist Party members who can act with the authority of the state, you can sequester entire neighborhoods and get food delivery organized. You can also put money through state-owned enterprises, get the banks to lend directly to who you want them to. You've got capital controls that other economies don't have. You have a certain growth model which allows you to buffer the shocks in a certain way. Then you get to Western Europe. Western Europe has long been trade dependent and something that economists observe for a long time is that the more open you are to trade, the bigger the welfare state you have because it's in a sense a giant shock absorber. So if you're in Denmark, you pay huge amounts of taxes. And at times like this, that means that you get a huge amount of consumption maintenance through those institutions. So there's a different way of cushioning the shock. One's a welfare state, one's a command and control state. When you get to the United States, it's very different. The United States growth model is basically optimized to run with no buffers. The basic idea, going back to the financial crisis, which showed it last time, is that the economy takes a shock, you protect the financial assets, you then allow the economy to adjust through wages and prices. In other words, price declines and unemployment. And the idea is that type of short, sharp shock allows the economy to come back without massive amounts of taxation or state intervention, et cetera. It's painful, but it tends to work. This type of crisis is not good for that type of model. Because whereas China has certain ways of controlling this simply because it is a very large, powerful state that can control in, in, in a classical sort of um, state-oriented way, and the Europeans have lots of different types of welfare institutions they can use to buffer shocks, everything from short working time to liquidity for companies through to direct cash transfer payments. In the United States, we're not really built for that. Getting a couple of checks in the mail for a couple of months to bail you over works on the assumption that this will be over in a couple of months. But if it's not over in a couple of months, that becomes very difficult for this type of economy in particular. Yeah, I, I find your discussion of models very persuasive. You have two great pieces. You've, you've published them in the last couple of days, one in foreign affairs, one in foreign policy. I recommend them to the audience where you, you talk about national models. I just want to make a quick a point about China. You're, you're absolutely right that there are command and control approaches institutionally that are used in China that, that just aren't available in other kinds of systems. But, you know, it's interesting to me that in democracies like South Korea, even there, there was a much more proactive response, I think, to the pandemic than what we've seen in Western Europe or North America. And there was a, a willingness, I guess I would say, on the part of the public to 
very rapidly engage in social distancing and to stop certain kinds of economic activity. And that seems to me to touch on issues of trust and social capital and maybe a, a kind of a legitimacy that these governments, South Korea and China, under very different kinds of political economies, different kinds of institutional setups, that they both seem to enjoy vis-a-vis -vis the Western democracies. Yes. I mean, in the 10 years since the crisis, but building up before that, if I can plug another book, and it's not mine, is uh, Jonathan Hopkin, who's a political scientist at the London School of Economics, has had a book come out called Anti-System Politics, which I think is the best summary of what's happened to party politics over the past 15 to 20 years. And Jonathan's argument of, for populism and all of its outpourings is that we've essentially fragilized the party systems over time. We've um, lost confidence, to put it that way, in state power and state institutions. We've politicized all the decisions that are made by the state has always been in favor of special interests, etc. And then when that happens, it's very hard to generate the types of public trust that you need to get those types of measures working on a voluntary basis. And we see this very clearly in the United States where some communities simply continue to think that social distancing is some kind of liberal conspiracy to unseat the president. And it begs the question why the Italians are going along with it if that's the case. But nonetheless, those polarization factors certainly don't make things any easier. You know, on the, on the subject of national models, I wanna talk um, with you a little bit about um, wage guarantees. So it seems to me, really, as a non-expert, that given that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with, say, the tourist industry or the airline industry or the restaurant industry, but they've just been pushed into hibernation for some period of time, it makes sense that the state would step in and just guarantee the wages of the employees who are temporarily furloughed. After all, in a few months, hopefully, th those jobs will be back in operation. But it seems that not that some societies are unexpectedly willing to do this, to have their governments provide wage supports, direct wage supports, and others like the United States aren't. Why is that? Again, it goes back to the underlying growth model in the United States. To, to compare two examples, the United States and the United Kingdom, they're very similar in many ways. And what was very interesting about the British response was they went straight to wage guarantees. Now, this was the country that 10 years ago under Cameron and Osborne were the austerity champions. And this time around, no, we're simply guaranteeing it. Why? And, and Mark, tell me, tell me how the wage guarantee works in the United Kingdom. Uh, that's a great question. What they actually do is they say to employers, keep paying. And the employer says, well, how can I do that? I don't have any customers. And they say, don't worry, we've got your back. And the government goes to the banking system and says, just keep allowing them to pay. And then we will guarantee you. So you already have a system set up whereby wages will flow. It's called how you pay wages. People have bank accounts. Why invent the thing all over again? In the United States, for reasons I really can't understand, we decided to start issuing checks which is like a 1950s technological approach. I mean, half the country can get payments on their phones instantly, and yet we're cutting checks. So again, a lot of the problems here are the how-to of politics rather than the arguments about it. But again, to go back to the wage guarantees or you know, consumption maintenance, the British and American economies are both 80% consumption. That's what drives them. And consumption is driven by wages plus credit. People are having a hard time maintaining their credit because their wages are falling and because they're becoming unemployed. So it makes sense to simply plug that gap on the expectation that this lasts a few months and then we're back. This, however, brings us into the, th the tricky question of a different type of set of models, the viral models which are being used to, pr to uh, predict where we go in this. And that leads to very different conclusions depending on which model you look at. There's one which we hope is right, which says that many, many people already have had the virus, it's the Oxford model, uh, and that suggests that after a very, uh, after a, an intense period of strain on healthcare services, we will pretty much be able to get back to normal. There's the one that's driving the debate, the Imperial College one, they did an update today, and they basically said, no, nah, sorry, that's not gonna work. Only around 3% of people have had the virus so far, as far as we can tell, which means that things may get better for a while, but there, may be, there will be multiple waves of this. It's not, I can imagine that countries like Sweden in an extreme, the United Kingdom can continue wage subsidies for multiple periods of time. I'm not sure the United States can do that. And then that begs the question, what do you do when the money runs out? What do you do when the money runs out? I don't what, really that, have a, what, what, does that, what does that mean to say the money runs out? The people literally have no money for groceries. 
Well, well, no, but I understand if the, but what does it mean to say that the government's money runs out or to put it differently it, in the United States, if I understand it correctly, we're telling people who've lost their jobs to apply for unemployment right. claims. And then these individuals are going to receive unemployment, presumably, and they're going to receive a check in the mail, but all the disruption of having to find another job and then all, all the disruption of losing a job and then finding another job later and all the indignities are suffered. Whereas if I understand you correctly in the UK in Denmark and Germany, um, wages are being directly paid. The employers remain intact and the state pays. So what would prevent the state from any of these states from undertaking these wage supports over extended periods of time? Eventually, someone has to want to buy that debt if you're going to debt finance this. Now, the, the concern back in the, the last crisis was the huge buildup of debt would cause inflation. That didn't happen. And then it would cause insolvency. Well, a sovereign government that prints its own cash can't technically go insolvent in the bonds it issues because it can always swap it out for cash. The question is, do people want to hold those bonds? And also, to use the term, what's the fiscal space that's available for countries to do this? So if you're already Italy with the, I think it's the 17th largest economy or 11th largest economy with the third biggest bond market in the world, you haven't grown in 20 years. If it wasn't for the ECB buying and backing your bonds, you would be in a terrible position already. If you're Britain, you're in a better position, but there's probably some finite limit on this one. For the United States, ironically, printing the dollar, the global reserve asset, the constraints are much less. What we've seen in this crisis, as we saw in the last one, is a flight into cash, and that means a flight into dollars. So if you get to print the dollars, that's good. But on the other hand, markets aren't stabilizing the way we saw the last time. And continued uncertainty in financial markets and continuing debt issuance could get problematic for some countries. And what we're seeing, I think, in, in China, which is going first in, in, in a way, um, much of society is returning to normal in terms of interactions, but the business environment hasn't returned to normal yet. And businesses have been um, slow to start up in some cases because of um, regulations preventing them from starting up. So even though the public health situation seems much better today, the state of anxiety much lower, the um, ability of the economy to move fully into um, operation seems to be still an open question. The, the duration, in other words, of the crisis is as yet unknown. Absolutely. And to go back to the different viral models, the unknown unknown on this is the denominator, how many people have been infected. And if you really knew that, then you could make some predictive arguments about when this will end, how intense it will be. But just simply the lack of testing, particularly in the United States, means that we have literally no clue as to what we're doing in terms of saying, oh, well, maybe it's Easter, well, maybe it's June. We simply do not know at this point. So yeah. that's unfortunately where we find ourselves. You know, I just wanna remind our audience, please um, ask questions or, or, or give us your comments. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, you can raise your digital hand um, and, or you can write down questions in the Q&A uh, using the Q&A function and those on Facebook Live can write your questions on Facebook and we'll, we'll get them. Uh, Mark, it sounds to me as if you are generally supportive of the idea of wage guarantees. Yes. What about company guarantees? What about whether we call it bailouts, whether we call it uh, subsidies, whatever we want to call it, what about governments directly providing resources to keep companies alive and keep their balance sheets solvent? So it depends on the company. Um, I've actually been quite skeptical about the notion that banks were too big to fail, that they were all interconnected. Because if you can tell someone that you're strategically important, then basically you will get the money, which licensed by the behavior. So let's think about some of the things that are supposedly strategically important. Cruise lines, I'm not convinced. Hotels, I'm not convinced. And part of the problem here is what capitalism is meant to be. We have a bankruptcy code for a reason. So let's think about airlines. Let's say that United Airlines stock or American Airlines stock goes down to zero. At that point in time, if and when things go back to normal, there will be planes 
there will be pilots, there will be staff, there will be hubs, there will be airports. Those are expensive and valuable assets and people will want to travel again. So someone else can come along and pick these things up and get it going. If you were doing wage guarantees fully, you could effectively let those assets go to zero and pick it up afterwards. Let the shareholders be the ones that bear the cost. After all, that's why they get the upside on the equity. That's a hard argument to make when the people who control those assets are some of the most powerful people in your society. And that's where the political economy of this comes in. Some sectors are definitely more important than others to support, but supporting the likes of cruise lines, I really just see this as a huge boondoggle and a bit of a mistake because there's no need to do that if you're actually doing the wage supports, which is the most important part. I guess I don't fully understand. So regardless of what we think of any one of these industries, none of them has caused this crisis, arguably, by their management, by their, by their approach to conducting business. Mm. They're sim they've simply been hit by this. They've more or less, so cruise lines, transport. Uh, Airlines, 96% so, of free cash flow and stock buybacks. Mm, not so great. No, no. My point, though, is none of their operations directly relates to what's currently keeping them out of business, which is right. to say a, a, a pandemic, a health crisis. And so I, I guess I don't fully understand why it makes sense to let any of these companies go under as a result of this kind of crisis. Or to put it differently, I mean, take the airlines because you've had your problems with them, I'm sure, traveling. I've had my problems with them. But a, you know, a company like American Airlines, I think it employs about 130,000 people. And if you let it go under, of course, the aircraft are still there, the airports are still there, but the amount of dislocation that would be imposed on the employees, on the various um, companies associated with them, would be vast. So why wouldn't it make sense, for the time being at least, just to sustain more or less everybody in place, whether it's a, a restaurant, whether it's a hotel, whether it's an airline, or whether it's a bank, until we can get through this exogenous shock, this exogenous crisis? So another paper that I wrote last week was for the Institute of Public Policy Research in the United Kingdom with uh, my co-author Eric Lonergan. And we argue for exactly the situation, which is to say, if you're going to bail, you should take a permanent equity stake, not a controlling state. This is not nationalization. But if the argument is we need to save these companies because they are worthy companies in the sense that if these conditions were not there, they would be making money. Then if we're going to provide the safety net, you should get the upside on the way out. So if we're going to take a third of the shares of, let's say, American Airlines, we should put them into the equivalent of a sovereign wealth fund, no political control, passively manage it, give them the liquidity that they need. And then when they start flying again, guess what? Those shares go up in value and that dividend can go to the whole public who, after all, were the ones who were bailing them out. So there are different ways of doing this. We're just not there yet. Fantastic. Um, look, I have a lot more questions, but let's go to some of the questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Um, let's start with, I'm just looking at these now. There's a, a question from Noah Pirani. Uh, great to hear from you, Noah. And your question, I'll just read it, if that's okay for, for sure. everybody, for the Everyone. audience. Uh, Noah writes, in the last few weeks, the Fed has effectively become credit underwriter for all U.S. corporate debt, including unsecured commercial assets. Is Mark, are you optimistic that federal equity in the private sector could lead to a real redistribution of wealth post coronavirus, or is a corporate debt bubble going to blow up in the Fed's face while the Adam Newmans of this world walk away unscathed? Well, even Adam might be a little scathed if we work goes to zero. Um, so this is a story of perverse incentives. If you keep interest rates super low, and if they're structurally low anyway, as they seem to be, uh, then it's a problem for corporations because they can borrow and issue bonds and write debt, if you will, and then use the bonds to buy back their own shares. And that's so much easier than making stuff. And that's what a lot of corporates have done. And one side effect of this is a giant corporate debt pile. That corporate debt pile at some point has to be reckoned with because corporations are not countries. Countries have a printing press. Countries have intergenerational taxation. Countries have the capacity to make credible commitments across generations so long as they're a reasonable country. Um, private sector firms simply can't do that. So there is a reckoning with this, whether it comes in the form of the Fed's balance sheet or whether it comes as a collapse in asset values, we'll see. But in a sense, that one was waiting to happen and would have happened eventually even without corona. Uh, 
Great. Let's take a question from Solange Hansen. Thanks for uh, weighing in. I encourage more of you to keep asking great questions. So Solange writes, I read that Canada offered a much healthier stimulus package. Would what Canada offered work in the U.S.? And will we ultimately get to that level of, of stimulus? I'm not entirely familiar with the real details of the Canadian package. I believe that it's similar to what the Brits have done. And to me, the question is rather than equity or, you know, a, a healthier stimulus package in that sense, is what's sufficient? And let's just go back to the example of what the Brits are doing. The Brits basically will be saying, uh, we're going to guarantee these wages and we're going to do it for as long as it takes. And we're going to use the existing infrastructure of wage payments and banking to make that happen. All right. I think Canada is going to do something similar. We've decided to mail checks to people. Let's hope we've got the right address. It seems to me that the question here is more of the efficiency of how you're doing it rather than the fact that you've got a slightly different program. Pretty much everyone is on board with maintaining consumption for uh, an indefinite but hopefully limited period of time. It is pretty remarkable to me, Mark, that Countries, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, countries like Denmark and the UK that had no tradition of providing wage supports have in very short order stood up a system for doing that. Is that the right read That's right, on this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Brits are the classic. I mean, it's completely unexpected for them to go down this road. But in a sense, it's been building for a while. A lot of people have been talking about so-called helicopter money, which is a way of saying, uh, of, of, of talking about direct cash transfers for a while. The Czech Central Bank two years ago came out with a piece saying that next time there's a crisis, we're going to do this. Several luminaries in central banking have said, look, with rates on the floor, this has to be the next step. So in a way, it was in, it was in the stars. It just wasn't aligned yet. And that's what's happened now. Great. Um uh, Diraj Gunjakunta has, uh, please, if I mispronounce anybody's name, apologies, for, forgive me, uh, but Diraj has a question about some of the long-term effects. Diraj writes, most of the assets the Fed got on its books in 2008 were still on its books at the start of this crisis. In addition, there's a lot more intervention from the Fed now than there was in 08. Is there going to be a long-term effect of having $6 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet? and so much credit available in the economy. Uh, what are the, lo the long-term effects in, in your view? I do love that Brown sophomores are asking more intelligent and more important questions than practically anybody in the media. So thank you for that. Well, that you, can a, you can include the sophomores asking much better questions than I'm asking. So <laughs> and hopefully keep, my, keep, hopefully, yeah, hopefully my up. answer is up to it. Absolutely. That is a, a totally brilliant question. I mean, in a sense, it's saying, can we all become Japan? Japan managed to blow its debt out to 200% and hasn't really lost much in nominal GDP, but at the same time, it's a very old society and we're all getting older. There's a way in which, you know, this is kind of baked into the cake as well, even without the crisis. I think the most important reading you can do on this is the piece by Olivier Blanchard at the end of, I think it was last year, or the end of his term of being the chief economist at the IMF, which basically says, don't sweat the debt. And the reason is the following. We took 20% of the global money supply as bailouts in 2008 through 2015 and chucked it in the global economy and still couldn't generate any inflation. Um, that was, tells you something. So, uh, interest rates have been falling apart from the 70s uh, and 80s through the 90s for about three to 400 years. And they're very low and they're going to stay very low, if not negative in real terms. Put those things together. So long as your economy is positively growing, your debt stock will shrink. This, in a sense, is the financial repression trick that was played by governments after World War II, and now it seems to be structurally baked into the cake. So, so long as the rate of growth in your economy is higher than the rate of growth in your debt stock and the interest payments thereof, you can balloon it out, but ultimately it will shrink. So that seems to be the hope. And I stress, it's a hope. And presumably in the near term, these payments, they're not generating, they won't generate growth per se. There's just not ac economic activity in so many parts of the economy, but instead they are, a, I don't know, a, a guarantee of life support during a period of hibernation, as I understand it. So people will be able to continue to pay their rent. People will be able to, companies will be able to service their debt. there will be just a basic stabilization if, if I've got it right. That's exactly correct. Yep. And after all, I mean, maybe similar to the Great Depression, what's the point of throwing if you're a landlord, what's the point of throwing a renter out into the street when you're not going to find somebody else to fill that apartment? So it's 
I think you alluded to this earlier, it's payments in the near term simply to guarantee that people can purchase food, that they can remain solvent in a sense until the economy gets back going again. And again, this is you know my favorite little set of stats for the United States in that regard as to why this is critically important. There's 330 million people in the United States. There's 270 million handguns. That's not even going for carbines and rifles. There's 80 million hourly workers and 28 million people have no health insurance in the most fragmented and expensive health insurance system in the world. You need to keep that whole and you need to keep those people fed. Otherwise, very bad things can happen. Right. We, I mean, just the numbers from the week before last, 3.3 million people applying for unemployment Absolutely. claims and uh, you know, talk of perhaps 30% employment. And if that happens, hopefully it's going to be over a short duration of time rather than an extended period. Let's turn to a question from Michael Dennis. Uh, Michael writes, we constantly hear that we're, um, that we're at war with the virus. Uh, leaving aside the metaphor, what is there about war financing that might lend itself to this moment? It strikes me, Michael writes, that this is a very special deflationary moment where the state's goal is to get money into the hands of consumers so that their spending becomes someone's income. How does the war metaphor, the war financing metaphor work here? I think it works on a rhetorical level, on an ideological level, that in a polity as polarized as ours, the one thing that we can do and the one thing that will unite us is a common enemy. So if the virus is the common enemy, which it is, then the war metaphor is a good way of basically emboldening action amongst people who would normally not act together. So I think it's really operating at the political level though. It makes a lot of sense. Let me remind those of you who are participating on Zoom, we'd love to hear your audio if you're willing to ask a, a question using your voice rather than your fingertips typing on the computer. So feel free to uh, raise your hands, so to speak, and I'll keep watching for you um, here on, on Zoom. But in the, for the time being, let's continue uh, taking the written questions from the audience. And here's one from Ivy Scott. Ivy writes, if and when things return to normal socially, do you anticipate that the speed at which businesses rebound will be the same as in China? Or will our failure to sufficiently support American businesses atrophy the commercial sector completely? Uh, this is, of course, Ivy writes, this is all, of course, dependent on the question of how long. Yeah, and that's exactly the key thing, the how long. So again, to go back to those two models that are guiding so much of the hope and response, if it's the Oxford outcome, it's not that long. And while in a large service sector economy, you're not going to make up for the, the lost restaurant meals or the massages that you didn't have. In a sense, that can be cushioned and that's what wage support is about. And we have a hit, we lose some GDP and then we move on. That's the good story. The bad story is that we take a long time to get over this. It takes a while to get an effective treatment and we have to live through at least one more wave. At that point in time, that's when it looks very difficult, particularly for small businesses. It, you can pick up after a month. If you've got three months cash flow support, you can survive those three months, possibly four. But if you have to survive a year, that restaurant doesn't open again. And that's the big problem. I think the Chinese case, which is unfolding just a few steps in front of us time-wise, the Chinese case is instructive and instructive about the ways in which we're connected globally. So at one level, the Chinese economy and society took a big hit because everybody had to aggressively social distance. People were frozen in their homes. People couldn't go to their jobs. It was just too dangerous. The government mandated that everything effectively stopped all over the country. So that induces the first kind of economic hit. Now things, have, things are starting to loosen. People feel more optimistic. They're able to go out. Some retail has opened up. Some manufacturing is back in play, but global demand now has stopped. So anything that's export oriented isn't really able to sell, except maybe uh, medical devices and medical products. We see that coming up to speed. And then there's a, a third feature of this that um, my sense is that the Chinese state is being extremely cautious about how much economic activity and social activity it permits to reopen because it's monitoring whether there's any more outbreaks of, of, of COVID-19. And so there's a certain tentativeness there and a recognition that things may have to be pulled back um, 
you know, um, in the near future. And you can see analogs to that in the United States now as some of the more vibrant parts of the economy, companies like Amazon are facing challenges by employees who aren't so excited about being in that workplace if their health isn't really protected. So there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of continued interconnectedness between how the pandemic is unfolding in different parts of the, the world. Let's uh, go to uh, the next question. And I recognize that some of you are also asking questions using the uh, chat function. So as we uh, improvise here, I'll be monitoring that one too. But uh, Barbara Stallings writes in with a, a question. Um, one each, in fact. You get to go first. Okay. Uh, Barbara writes, um, what if it's true that the Chinese have been lying to a significant extent about the numbers related to the virus? Is it relevant? And if so, why? That was directed toward me. And then to Mark, Barbara asks, is there really a, a quote unquote Swedish model that's significantly different even than its near neighbors? If so, what is this model? And is it something other countries should pay attention to? And uh, Mark, I'm interpreting Barbara's question to refer to the Swedish model of, um, yeah, of mild, mild social distancing, to Absolutely. say the, the least. Barbara, if we got that wrong, correct us. Why don't you go ahead, Mark, and answer? So the Swedish model for people who haven't been intensely following this is basically to do social distancing, but on an individual basis. The prime minister did an address where he got up and said, look, this is Sweden. We have high levels of social trust. That means that individual responsibility is there, but the state has your back. We're not going to mandate lockdowns. We're one of the most technologically advanced societies in the world. Half the country can work from home. Let's try it. And we're not going to do a draconian lockdown. So 50% of people immediately started working from home. The cafes are still open. They haven't had a big spike yet. That seems to be very interesting. However, if you follow what's going on in Sweden, a lot of the Swedish uh, public health and infectious disease people are getting very, very nervous, if not very, very angry with the government for essentially hoping that Sweden's uniqueness can see them through a crisis which doesn't care which country you are. So it may be the case that that particular version of the Swedish model may not last. On the other hand, if it does, it would be a superb model for everyone else, but it's always the problem with Sweden. You kind of need to be Sweden to pull this off. You need to have high levels of social trust, high levels of personal responsibility, and basically trust in your state, none of which the United States really seems to exhibit that well. You know, on the Swedish model, there's, there seems to be another variant of this in the Japanese model, if I understand that correctly. So Japan, very early in the pandemic, closed all of its schools and had a, you know, a, a rather dramatic response on that front, but didn't move forward very aggressively with social distancing. So still lots of interaction. And I think there too, we're hoping that there won't be a, a, a major spike in COVID cases, but people are watching to see whether that experiment um, and how that experiment plays out. Uh, to your question, Barbara, about the data coming from China, of course, there's, there's a lot of skepticism and on a lot of different fronts. And I would say first that um, the data, to the best I understand them, have been complicated and problematic from a lot of different countries. So whether or not a given country is reporting deaths at home uh, rather than just deaths in the hospitals, that complicates some of the data. The quality of some of these data across different countries is questionable and sometimes quite confusing. We know that at least initially in China, some of the local level data in Wuhan in particular wasn't making it up. I, I think we know it wasn't making it up to the center. It was distorted in various ways that perhaps aren't entirely unexpected. I think there's a growing sense now, um, unconfirmed, but a growing sense that the reported levels of deaths in China are probably low and particularly for Wuhan the city of Wuhan and Hubei province, generally that there are certainly some observers who feel that those um, death rates are probably higher, um, including some observers from within China. I think more broadly though, um, the general sense is that beyond Wuhan, the level of outbreak in other Chinese cities wasn't particularly dramatic or that the just the normal reports we get through social media interactions suggest that all of the social distancing that was enforced um, 
prevented or at least was associated with any kind of major spike in cases and deaths, which we would have heard about through social media beyond Wuhan in particular. But I think the underlying sense of your question is, is right, that we just don't know about the quality of data at this point from China and beyond China as well. Let's take a, a couple of more, a couple more questions. Uh, so let's take one from Christopher Garrity. I see a question, uh, Nick, from Nick, Nick Ziegler, but I don't see the rest of the question. Maybe you have- It's further down. It's further oh, Okay, I'll, 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 sorry. So let's go in the order that I'm getting them. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. Let's go with uh, Christopher Garrity's question. Uh, Chris, Christopher writes in your class, um, he's referring to your class, Mark. My I class, believe. absolutely, yes. In, in your class, we read about the dominance of the dollar in international financial markets. It appears that many post-Soviet states with their own new currencies are seeing the value of, for example, Kyrgyz sums to dollars declining. Is this a common occurrence globally right now? And if so, does it reduce the case for euro, pound, yen, yuan challenging the dollar? Uh, yes. And we could literally stop there. Um, so we've been waiting for the dollar to fail forever. And every time there's a crisis, people want to hold dollars because it's 60% of foreign exchange reserves and denominates almost the same amount of transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So when investors get nervous and they want to flood into cash, they do not want to go into the Kyrgyz sum. They want to go into the one thing that probably will go up when everything else is going down, which tends to be the dollar. Uh, the euro is relatively stable at the moment. The pound took a, a spanking, um, mainly, in fact, because of its announcement right out of the gate of 80% wage subsidies, which made investors think, well, the deficit's going to blow out. If the deficit blows out, they import two-thirds of their food. That means that the pound's going to go down. If the pound goes down, the food's going to cost more. They'll get inflation through the import channel, which means that unemployment's going to be even worse. Yeah, Britain's looking a bit crap. Let's dump the pound. So there was a structural decline in the pound because of that. But in a sense, that's the price that they're paying for doing the wage guarantees, which isn't really that bad a price. You can deal with a downward wage adjustment. But for the dollar, no. It's, as Mel Brooks once said, that great economist, it's good to be the king. <laughs> um, you know, somewhat related to that, let's, let's just go to Peter Deegan's question. So he asked whether the pandemic will affect protectionist politics around the world, so tariff levels, immigration levels, but let's also include capital controls. Do you think the pandemic is going to have any impact, and if so, what impact on capital controls, as well as things like immigration and protectionism? I think it's already started. I mean, back in 2015, when China loosened capital controls and a huge amount of money exited the country, uh, which, which uh, sounded some alarm bells in Beijing, they've been tightening rather than loosening. And if anything, the lesson of this crisis is good to have capital controls. Argentina is basically in default once again with the IMF. I believe they've actually formally said to the IMF, we're not paying. So you can expect some capital controls to go up there. And then, you know, in, in, the, in the broader sense of being a, a technology of control in moments of crisis, if you continue to see very, very rapid declines in asset values across interlinked markets, then governments will step in to break those links. There's a debate back in Europe about whether short selling should be banned. That's usually the first step. You get rid of the short sellers and then you basically have holidays and then you begin to bang up capital controls. So if things get bad enough, I mean, Iceland was the exemplar the last time around. Iceland had managed to wreck its economy so thoroughly that the only thing that they could do was capital controls. And they did and they worked quite well. So, yes, I think that, you know, we're going to see more of that. In terms of protectionist policies, yeah, it's a mixed bag. Um, unfortunately, uh, the most important commodity for the globe is food. And we're already beginning to see signs of food protectionism amongst countries. We're beginning to see a, a really strange blowback effect on this. Those uh, immigration policies that are so popular with populists against bringing in migrant workers. Well, in the combination of pandemic, pandemic plus the crackdown of migrant workers, I'm not entirely sure who's picking all the crops in the United States and the United Kingdom anytime soon at a time when we're sequestered. So food could start to get very expensive because of the way that these things play out. So I don't think it's a kind of linear response, but the fact that all of these things have been taken for granted as being non-problematic for so long was already politicized before we got hit by the pandemic and the pandemic is going to continue to make those things more problematic than they've hitherto been. <laughs> 
you know, there's a little bit of a feeling, maybe a lot of a feeling that um, even when things return back to quote unquote normal, whether it's months or however long it is, there's no real going back on a mm -hmm. lot of this stuff that somehow institutionally we're in a different place from where we were before and there, there is no going back. Um, so moving from protectionism to something else, surveillance, what, what about the willingness of publics across many different kinds of countries to subject themselves to surveillance uh, because of the pandemic, whether it's health data, whether it's um, geographical, locational data, where do you think we're headed on, on that front? Well, I, I would bow to your expertise on this one because this is one where it seems that uh, China and the, the societies in that part of the world are very much ahead of Western societies, um, perhaps because of the liberal traditions, perhaps because of the concern for civil liberties, etc. But we're very much behind the curve, yet places such as Singapore, South Korea show us that these technologies to do with contact tracing, et cetera, can be incredibly effective tools and very important tools. So if we really are in a world that the imperial model predicts whereby very few of us have been infected, it means that any subsequent wave can be very damaging. Therefore, if we manage to get a hold of this first wave and have a breathing space in which to rearm, a really sensible part of the rearmament would be to de de deploy as much technological monitoring as possible. Uh, whether we are equipped to do this politically particularly in more polarized countries, that's an open question. But it seems that it's definitely on the agenda and it's not going to go away. What's your feeling on this, Ed? I think we're equipped to do it politically. I think we're doing it without thinking very clearly about it, just as we've been doing it on the commercial side without thinking very clearly about it. My concern, and I think there are lots of upsides, whether it's for contact tracing of humans in the case of a pandemic, whether it's food traceability, there are all kinds of positives from all of this data collection and analysis. At the same time, you know, once you open that Pandora's box, it, it is really hard to put things back in. And I, I do think our, our privacy is um, somewhat non-existent. Today. But all, it's, it's also going to put the whole issue of the fangs, Facebook and Google, yeah. et cetera, back on the front burner once we get out of this. Because if it's those digital platforms which are being leveraged to both harvest and then interpolate and interpret all these data, then that produces even more questions of political power and representation in private hands. And in a more nationalistic or less globalized world, in particularly American hands, because all of those platforms are American. So that brings up the whole issue of the splinter net rather than the internet, et cetera. Again, things which could be accelerated by this moment. Yeah, and whether it's data in private hands or public hands, it's not in the individual's hands. And right. that, that's a problem when it's the individual's private, quote unquote, data, and it's in somebody else's hands. So, so, so just to plug the book that I still have coming out in June called Angrynomics, one of the things, Eric, and I talk about that is the need for countries to sell their data. So we sell mobile phone spectra for billions of dollars, and then we give a license to use certain frequencies. Yet when we use Facebook, we give up the data for free because you're getting to use the platform for free. No, stop. Basically, we should have an opt-in, opt-out. And if you want to opt-in, then your data is sold by the state on a term contract to whoever wants to use it. And then we get the cash back so that there's actually a proper market contract in this. And then you could build your privacy safeguards around this. This is not difficult to do. This is just somebody having the vision to do it. Right. Let's, let's take uh, some questions from our Facebook uh, participants. So this is a question from Nunia Business, and she writes, what's the downside of just giving everyone $1,500 or pounds a month and simply ceasing rent and mortgage payments for the duration? So the downside is if you're a private landlord. So let's say, not to say that they're the most important people in the world, I'm just giving one example, right? So you're a private landlord and I'm no longer allowed to collect rent. All right, then the more I'm not allowed to, I don't have to pay the mortgage. Okay, so then the mortgage servicer isn't getting their cut. And then somewhere along the line, someone really is receiving no income. So either you have to bail the entire system all the way through, or someone is left carrying the can, and that's going to create a bigger hole that you're going to have to fill somewhere else. So while sort of rent holidays and, and cash transfers, I'm all in favor. I'm a fully paid up member of the club. And doing this for up to six months, I think, would be difficult but non-problematic. Essentially, if you follow the logic through on this, essentially it's like, well, why not just have free public money and nobody really owns anything? 
And when you get to that, that opens a whole host of questions that I don't think the United States at all is prepared to even begin having that conversation. So it's, it's not clear that you can do this beyond having this as a temporary fix. The idea is that work is exchanged for labor. That's the basic contract. And if you basically start saying that sustenance will be exchanged and there will be no labor extracted, that begs big questions about how capitalism operates and what the incentive structure for getting things done actually is. Yeah, it really is quite remarkable how this shock is asking a lot, forcing us to ask a lot of questions about how capitalism operates. And and it forces us to recognize how quickly huge swaths of the economy just can stop, basically, and and, and cease. You know, you you just mentioned labor, Mark, and Nick Ziegler had a a question related to labor. He asks... um, do you see the pandemic giving unions more or less bargaining leverage in company level negotiations over wages? And, and I want to, if I can just add, situate that in your sense of different national models. Mm-hmm. So it's inter- to, in order for labor to have a power, labor would have to have some power. So in countries where they're already still at least more than the shell of collective agreements, et cetera, or they have rules for putting comp- workers on boards, et cetera, then I can see that those things would be reinforced. But for getting them on the agenda in economies such as the UK, difficult but not impossible. The US, there is outside of the public sector, the labor movement is tiny. So the idea that the pandemic is going to give unions more powerful is only, power- is only powerful to the extent that you have unions to empower. And if you don't, then then not. And having the sort of the Elizabeth Warren type solution to that of we will appoint people to boards. Yes, you can do that. But then if you look at American corporate governance, we have rules against insider compensation getting out of hand and that certainly didn't work. Let me uh, also go to another one of our our, um, YouTube live. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, from YouTube. Um, this is a question again for you, Mark. Do, do you think that crypto is going to see wider a- adoption due to all that's happening with these bailouts? No. Um, Why not? Because I spent two months once reading everything I could about crypto, and I've come to the conclusion that it's not money. It's just not. So if, if money's meant to be three things in the textbook, a store of value, its volatility means that doesn't work. It's a unit of exchange. Nobody uses them to buy and sell things. And it's a unit of account. Nobody banks in crypto. Everybody still banks in dollars. And it's not a hedge against uncertainty. It is, as I believe the Chinese government uh, designated, I believe in 2014, a digital gambling asset. Now, if you want to put your money into a highly volatile digital gambling asset and then try and pay the bills, you'll just end up converting it back to dollars. So until until central banks actually do this, until you get direct accounts at the central bank for individuals. Robert and I Hoff- think you're, you will see that in China first. Yes. Yeah, and that's the type of crypto that they're working on. And that's the type of crypto that can work. Yeah. Um, Which I think Rob- is more, maybe better understood as, as a state provided yeah. digital wallet. Essentially. Yeah, it's, yeah, essentially, the, the state is abandoning all pretense of printing anything and is simply doing direct electronic transfers from the central bank, knocking out the commercial sector as intermediaries, which is easier to do in China than it is in Western banking systems. So it's, it's a crypto in name, but it's basically state money in its nature. So that could go ahead. That may happen. But in terms of the sort of the Wild West cryptos, no, they're still just basically gambling assets. It is pretty extraordinary how um, widespread digital payment is in China, Uh, you know, that people just aren't handling cash, even for normal transactions, buying fruit from a a street peddler. And um, the ramifications for um, flexibility are great, but so too for privacy and and some of the other issues we were talking about earlier. Let's go to a, a question from Sarah Lewis. Sarah writes, if widespread testing would provide the best insight into the scope and longevity of this economic crisis, but testing remains largely unavailable in America, that's not what uh, President Trump says, but alas, if, if, if testing remains largely unavailable in America, is there any other way to make dependable predictions about what the next few months may entail, or should we operate under the assumption that this crisis will linger for a long time? It depends upon one crucial thing, and the Brits are investing heavily in this, antibody testing. So testing for the virus requires PCR reaction machines and 
getting samples from the back of people's noses and lots of things which are quite difficult. Whereas a simple blood test can do an antigen or antibody test. So the Brits have ordered a million kits and are trying to test up to 25,000 people a month going forward from April. And that will give us in a large enough population, along with testing of, of a similar nature, which is going on outside the, outside the UK, uh, an idea as to the proper spread of what's going on. It will allow us in a sense to adjudicate between the optimism embedded in the Oxford model and the pessimism of the imperial model. And I really hope that we find out that 30% of the British public have been passive, have already got antibodies, and this is short-lived and we can get back to work. But until we have those data, there's no way of making that call. And particularly the United States, because despite what the president says, I literally, I'm sitting here in Providence, I'm a, a, a well-appointed professor at a great university, I don't know how to get a test. I literally don't know how to do it. And of course, there are other sources of data, to your earlier point, um, whether it's self, self-reported self symptoms, um, whether it's fever, that data that's been collected in, uh, on, a, on a very large scale, uh, not obviously just in North America, but, but worldwide. And I think people will be monitoring that for exactly the reasons that you you mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're reaching the, the end of our hour, but I want to ask a, a question that um, Chris Garrity mentioned. So, Mark, what's the, the most important thing in your sense that the public and academia is overlooking during the current pandemic? Is what's, what are we not talking about that we should be? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, what are we not talking about that we should be talking about? Maybe we should be thinking about this more as an opportunity. Yeah, so, so in the sense that, you know, the last time there was a big financial crisis, there was all these articles that said, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste, et cetera. And we absolutely did. But let's just think about healthcare, regardless of what you think in terms of your economic ideology or however you want to put it. Having a healthcare system that's twice as expensive as everyone else, where people like me who have coverage are thousands of dollars out of pocket before we can even access our policies. And then you have 20 million, 28 million people in your society, all of whom will crowd emergency rooms and hospitals in, in, in the event of a pandemic. That's, that's a very fragile system. So whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's some kind of insurance-based system like the Germans have, basic catastrophic coverage and access, and then you can build on top of that, this is an opportunity to kind of get the partisanship out of this and say, look, we just got walloped by a virus. A lot of people died, and it cost us an awful lot of time, resources uh, 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 to deal with this. Can we make the system more robust? Can we actually invest in such a way that we don't have to go through this again? So I think if we think about that in terms of healthcare and healthcare markets, we could also look at labor markets. It's fine having 80 million hourly workers with no statutory sick pay so long as everything's going great and no one can get sick. But we now know that things can go wrong and people can get sick and simply chucking checks in the mail and hoping for the best is really a second best solution. So maybe what we should be thinking about are the creative ways in which we can leverage this crisis to make sure that the next time we face something that's collectively punishing, we're actually able to better weather that punishment. And to your earlier points about comparing models, I I think it's interesting that countries that have universal health care aren't necessarily doing better. It's, it may be a different kind of response, but the answers to what the public health or what the, what the healthcare solution is, they're not obvious, they're not clear. But I think what is obvious is that the current systems in the world's most advanced industrial countries, most advanced industrial democracies are generally not doing that well. They're not serving the public I, I would differ, I would differ slightly. The Germans didn't, ha- didn't cut during the past 10 years in the way that Southern Europe has done. Part of Italy's response has been 10 years of budgetary austerity. You cut mm-hmm. down your ICU beds because they're expensive. You don't have any redundancies. Germany has tons of ICU beds and does massive testing because it was able to weather the crisis well, and it yeah. chose to invest. Yeah, I would say that universal systems such as the NHS actually do do better and will be shown to do better. I think that the really weak chain here is the United States, and we really need to have a good long look at what the system that we've built because it is really not fit for purpose. Yeah, great. I mean, I love the comparative analysis. I would add something maybe perhaps obvious, but um, I think true nonetheless. The current crisis, it, it's it, it's to some extent analogous to climate change. There's certain kinds of human problems that just 
don't care about borders. They're, they're <laughs> problems that completely transcend borders and that emphasize, and I don't mean this in a cliched sense, that emphasize how interconnected we are. Yet in recent years, I think it's fair to say, at least in the United States, we've disinvented, disinv disinvested in public health and we've mm -hmm. disinvested in the kinds of monitoring mechanisms that are needed, the kind of bureaucratic mechanisms that are needed, needed regardless of where we are in the political spectrum, disinvested and also disinvested in the kinds of information sharing across borders that are increasingly important, I think, or that we're seeing the importance of for identifying these kinds of crises before they become crises. And how we um, turn that problem around in the coming years is, I think, going to be a major challenge. I agree. But, I just say, I just say very quickly in closing, yeah. and a, a way that I think about this is uh, to riff off of Greta Thunberg. I always like her line when she says, "When you're arguing against climate change, you're arguing with physics. When you're arguing against a virus, you're you're arguing against the virus." There are things we can argue against. They're called people, but you can't argue against physics and you can't argue against biology. To do so really is futile. Yeah. Well, Mark, we've reached the end of our hour, but I especially want to thank you. This is, you're so insightful as always. And I, I want to thank everybody in the audience. To me personally, it's so reassuring to see all of you participating, hear all of your great questions and ideas. This is um, really a terrific expression of um, your resilience and our determination to keep on going in the face of a major challenge. I want to wish all of you good health and safety. And again, keep on participating. It's great for all of us. Thanks, everybody. And thank you. Thank Mark. you very much. Bye-bye.